Tim Hobson. All right, welcome everyone. Oh, did he? Oh, I, I need to talk to him. To the panel of history, I'm Sandy Arani. I'm a professor in the computer science department. Um, I'm currently vice chair, I think is my title, vice chair of the department. Um, held various positions over the years, and I came to UCI in 92. So I don't like to do the math that often, but it does mean that I've been at UCI for over 26 years now. That being said, I'm a rookie compared to our distinguished panel here. So um, we're gonna hear their wisdom from over the years, and I'm gonna let them first introduce themselves and say a little bit about their connection um, to ICS and UCI. Um, oh, I am Mike. Okay. I'm Deborah Richardson, and I was the founding dean of the School of Information and Computer Sciences, but I actually came here in 1987 as an assistant professor. Um, I am in the Department of Informatics now, but of course I came in the Department of Information and Computer Sciences before we became a school. Uh, my research domain, I don't know, is, has been software engineering, but now I'm actually working almost exclusively on computer science education topics. I'm Marcia Drapkin Hopwood. I came here in the fall of 66 as a graduate student in psychology. That lasted one week. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, had a deal with the uh, Dean of Social Sciences, Jim March, uh, to do computer stuff, whatever that might be, and with the agreement that if I finished before there was a program in computer science, I'd have a degree in social science with a cover letter that said I was not what I appeared to be. <laughs> I was the first uh, graduate student in ICS. I'm Fred Tong. I uh, came to UC Irvine in 1964. Uh, about two dozen faculty came a year before students came to plan the campus, together with the deans and Julian Feldman, the other early faculty member of ICS, and I were among those two. Uh, at the time, uh, um, one of the people among the academics was Ralph Girard, who was a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a microbiologist, very well connected. He believed in computers and education. He cut a deal with IBM, with the chancellor's support, uh, to, for a joint research project that IBM sent some hardware. And so somebody realized that they needed faculty involvement in doing something about this hardware and this project, and because I had some years in, in uh, industry, I became the first director of computing facilities. Uh, and Julian and I and several other faculty members decided we need a programming, we need computer, some computer science, so we started a program which was called Information and Communication Science with one course, ICS-1. Uh, in the first year, I think there were four or five session, sections of that, and Julian taught one, I taught one, and Ralph, uh, the dean of, of engineering taught one, Bob Saunders, another engineering faculty taught one, and the, that's all I remember. <laughs> uh, and I guess I should add, all memories are suspect. <laughs> Uh, my name is Larry Rowe, and I came to Irvine in the fall of 1966. Uh, took ICS-1 uh, from, I don't know who taught it that semester, but uh, Marsha was my TA, and uh, Greg's out here somewhere was hanging around as well. Um, I came back and did a PhD. I was a student of uh, Fred's. I actually was a math undergraduate. Um, and then I went to Berkeley and spent 25 plus years as a faculty member at Berkeley and retired in the early 2000s. These days, uh, I do a little bit of consulting, a little mentoring for startup companies. I'm part of, a, of an incubator group in Berkeley where we do uh, angel investing and, and consulting and advising for, for that. But much more importantly, my wife and I actually have a wine business that we <laughs> acquire grapes in Napa, make wine, and sell it. So that's where most of my time goes. And the name is? And the name is, is so that everyone can buy it. Grayscale Wines. <laughs> I'm John King. I uh, came to uh, UC Irvine kind of by accident as a student in 1969. 
and kind of wandered around the campus like a leaderless samurai for a number of years and ended up getting a PhD in the management school. And uh, when I was about done with the management school and graduate school of administration at the time, Fred was leaving. And I not only took his salary control number, <laughs> those of you who've done uh, administrative work in the University of California will remember that. I didn't I, know that. I got, I got his office and his books, um, or some Did of Did you get books. a salary? Uh, no, no, I didn't get a salary. <laughs> I was happy to be employed. Um, and uh, in 2000, I left to go to the University of Michigan, and I brought my hat as proof uh, um, to fulfill my wife's and my lifelong desire to retire in the northern Midwest, and uh, that's what we did. So um, I was department chair from 1984 to 1989. I considered the founding of the school to be around the time that Fred was there, and then the, the transition to the School of Information and Computer Sciences uh, Friends School was Deborah's work. And I was a colleague of Dick's. I'm Dick Taylor. I came in 1982 as a, an assistant professor I retired officially in 2013, and I still have an office, and I still come in and can't, can't escape the place. I've had the, I was brought here by really Tim Standish and his work, but what really convinced me to stay here was the grad students. And it has been my privilege over my time here to supervise 30 PhD students. All right, let's just dive into our history, shall we? Um, so my first question is if you can give me some perspective on what were the founding principles or ideas on which the school was founded, and how did those evolve over time? Maybe, Fred, you can start off since you were one of the founders <laughs> after all. Yeah, I, I can start off. Uh, that question assumes there were founding principles and ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I mean, many of you have been in startup companies. This was a startup. It was in the, within the general framework of UC, but it was all the excitement and problems and political stuff and all that that happens in a startup. Uh, so I would say the most important thing was that both Julian and I had been at Carnegie Tech, now Carnegie Mellon. Um, in the Graduate School of Industrial Administration, which meant Herb Simon, uh, Al Perlis, um, Alan Newell. And that was such an exciting place. And one of the reasons it was exciting and something that really carried over what we tried to do with computer science was that the students were full partners. That, uh, you, went, you were all invited to faculty seminars, undergraduate, graduate alike. Uh, you could listen to people whose name you might recognize, like Herbert Simon, Benoit Mendelbroit, the, the uh, fractals man, arguing over something and grabbing the chalk back and forth from each other, and, and the students occasionally being brave enough to say a word or two. Uh, but we, I think we tried to capture that notion that was one of the, the other thing you need to realize is computer science was just new. I've already forgotten, but I think it was 1965 was the first PhD in computer science in this country. And for your information, it was in May of 65 from the University of Wisconsin, and the person who did the work, which is on, on inductive inference, inference from computer-generated patterns, was Sister Mary Kenneth King, I believe. No, it's not her right name, last name. <laughs> I have to look it up. <laughs> it's what I said about memory. The important thing was it's a woman. Keller. The important thing is it was a woman. So that was really the first PhD in this country. Of course, the Brits were there uh, maybe 10 years before that. But, and the first computer science department was Purdue in 1962, which was a program in math and really split off as a department in 72. So computer science was a, a very new thing. Uh, as you can tell, I looked a bunch of stuff up on the internet, which also is questionable, but uh, 
<laughs> One of the quotes I found which really interesting was from a person who was a graduate student at that time and graduated maybe the second or third Penn PhD. And he said, you know, the thing about computer science was the faculty were all from someplace else. Uh, and they had their peer group, they were, and the only people who really understood what computer science about, was about was the graduate students. <laughs> So, so Larry and Marsh can comment on how that held at Irvine. Uh, John. Yeah, I, I, I came into it somewhat late, but I'd been here at Irvine uh, and in, other, in other fields and in the management school. And the thing that really, well, two things intrigued me about ICS. Um, the first one was there was a, a very strong orientation to application of the technology which um, if you know something about the history of computer science and other areas, other universities, they were kind of into devices and computing and not so much into application. So application was very attractive to me. And the other thing was we had one, uh, we had one of the first artificial intelligence groups, a really good artificial intelligence group. And there's something about AI. AI people are almost always really interesting. And uh, I, I found that when I, when I talked to them, they were really interesting. Um, I didn't want to work with them, but I, uh, uh, but I found them really interesting. Um, and so that, those were both two things that struck me as important. I, I, I want, that reminds me of one other thing that I think came from Carnegie and from many other good universities, which is get the best faculty. Don't say, okay, we're gonna build this area, but go for the best people that are there and go for the best students you can, can attract. Uh, Junior and I both took that pretty seriously as did later factory men, like Tim, I know, brought in some good people. Uh, it just, that was, well, if, that, if there was any one real the idea that may have, may have been it. I think another unique thread in ICS has always been this focus on social impact. Um, and that was here from the beginning, before my time. Yeah. Rob Kling. Rob Kling, yeah. I think the so, independence the of ICS from any other school was critical in the development of the field in the way you describe it. Because if you look at other universities, they're either mathematicians hemmed in by mathematics, or electrical engineers hemmed in by double E. And for a mathematician to think that human factors count, that would be anathema. Here it was, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Almost because of the diversity of our background, we had to talk to each other. Um, because people came from, there, there, were no, there was no cadre of information and computer scientists around. So we were backgrounds, math, engineering, psychology, business administration, um, all over the place. And I think that made us more of a social group as well. There was a lot of uh, interaction outside of straight classes. Like after some of the uh, presentations from uh, Mike Allen Newell, there was a, a dinner. And we'd all get together. And in fact, we cooked some of them at uh, Larry's apartment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing I think that that I remember most and am most fond about is that you talk about the big computer science department, it was probably eight people, 10 people. I mean, that's what it was that, that first year. And the classes at, in 66, there was ICS 1, 2, and 3. I, are those still the relevant numbers? Are those? There was a, one was introduction to programming, two was uh, machine, machine language, and we did it on an IBM 360. Um, because that was the machine Gerard got. And ICS-3 was data structures. And Fred taught that using Snowball 3, uh, created by Dave Farber at Bell Labs. And Dave came here for a couple of years uh, later in that period. But um, it was just a small group of people. And when it came time to do the next class, the ACM had just published a recommended curriculum for computer science. And Fred would call all of the students that were kind of hanging around into this office and say, okay, guys, what class should we do next? <laughs> and so 
And so we, were, we would say, oh, God, we're real interested in this one. And you go, okay, let's go get that. <laughs> so this was not a big organized thing like this. This was, this was very different. Well, I guess we've come a long way then, huh? Um, so I think one of the defining features of ICS is that it's always had an open-minded approach to the, to the discipline. And this philosophy is reflected in our structure. While most computing-related departments are housed in a school of engineering or a school of physical sciences, um, we've been too broad to fit into one of those structures. And CMU is another place that comes to mind that has a similar cross-cutting view of the field. And they were also one of the first universities to have a standalone school dedicated to, to computing-related fields. So can you comment on how our vision of the field has affected the academic structure of computing at UCI and vice versa? Maybe, John, you can start out with that. Well, I, I, th I think, for, for me, the most important thing about ICS was um, well, Kurt Lewin, who is a, a kind of a founder of, of psychology and the psychology of consulting, uh, once said that you, you make a lot faster progress by getting problems out of the way than by solving problems. Uh, and um, <laughs> one of the things that happened with ICS was just a lot of problems were not in the way uh, because of the independence of the, of the program. And I, I think that ended up being structurally really important to the school. It, it, kept, it kept the school kind of off balance and looking for new things. And that was intellectually inter really interesting setup. So I made exactly this argument when we actually did become a school. Um, when I became chair, I had already watched three, at least three different chairs fight with a dean um, over ICS joining their school. And I said to myself, I am not going to fight with a dean for five years. You know, I'm just with some other dean. So I'm going to settle this once and for all. But one of the arguments I made, both to the faculty as well as to the, the academic senate here at UC Irvine, is that we were way too diverse plug into one school or another. We had people who were engineer, more engineering-like, we had people who were more mathematics-like, and we had people who were more social science-like. And if we had, say, joined the School of Engineering, which was kind of the logical choice at that time in, in, in the 2000, early 2000s, um, because all the other UCs had their school, their computer science in the School of Engineering, we probably would have lost at least a third of the faculty would have walked away and said, I'm not joining a school of engineering. So that was part of the argument, was that we were so diverse that we really had to go somewhere else. And I think you know, our diversity has also impacted the field of computer science in ways, because we have people talking to each other that are at, doing very different things, but making some new innovations in computer science by being able to work together. I think if we'd become part of engineering, you would have also lost some of the students, the female students. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and that really was true from the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, there were predatory yep. deans yep. from day one at UC Irvine. <laughs> um, and we were very fortunate that we had three or four people in power who were very supportive. Didn't get into March, the dean of social science was one. Uh, Ralph Gerard, who I mentioned before, was another. Another thing you, you all owe Ralph for is the anteater. He, when, when the question came out, what should be the, the mascot, Ralph Gerard was the man pushing for something that said Zot. <laughs> <laughs> and then Jack Helveson, whose streets you drive on every day, uh, was the, the vice chancellor, and he was very supportive. He and March had been friends for a number of years, uh, and the chancellor was supportive. So the story I've heard about Jack Peltison is that when ICS was founded, and I believe I heard this from Julian, um, there was a letter written that said ICS has five years, five-year sunset clause to become a, to decide which school it wants to join. You know, are you going to go with physical sciences, or are you going to go with engineering, or something else? And then Jack left in that five-year period, uh, went to Illinois, and somehow that letter got lost. <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> I think it was lost in Julian's office. 
Yep, and it was. In it's probably days. still lost in Julian's office. <laughs> no, in the, no, in the early days, in the early days, we were out in trailers. Yep. We, weren't, we weren't in a building, That's right. and you know those trailers, the, they get a lot of water and stuff like that. And how many times did you move? And gosh, you lost books and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Well, I just learned at dinner last night that our very first student, graduate student in ICS, was a woman. This is Marsha. So I didn't actually know that. Um, and I feel like we've actually carried that tradition on of diversity through the years. Um, so UCI is a campus, and ICS in particular has been a leader in cultivating diversity and social mo mobility. So I'm wondering if you guys can comment on ways in which our structure and leadership has enabled us. I think it was a large part the leadership we had. The, Fred has talked about it. We were. Um, student focused, um, everybody was a, on a first name basis. Um, there were really no, no rules, no boundaries. We kind of made it up as we went along. Um, and unlike other schools, like I won't say engineering here, but certainly my previous experience, mm -hmm. I was not welcome in engineering. I took classes, but it was pretty clear they didn't want me there. Um, the same kinds of things would happen in other areas. That wasn't here, so it just much easier. I, mean, I think the only <coughs> comment I'd gotten at one point that you could relate to gender was I was warned not to wear short skirts when I TA to class. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we've always strived to increase the diversity. Um, I remember walking into a class in the mid-90s, and I walked into my class and I looked around. There was about 120 students in the room, and there were about six women I could find. And so this was one of our low points. It was one of the nation's low points, I would say, in terms of the, the number of women that were pursuing computer science. Um, and that's when I actually went out and said, we have to do something about this. And we formed the Women in Information and Computer Science Club, WICS. Um, and it was really because, although there were more than six women in the program, when you get into a class and there's not very many in a class, you really need somewhere else that you can really bounce ideas off of or you know, have some affinity with other people. And so that was one thing that we did fairly early for that kind of a, an organization, an affinity organization for women. And now there's all kinds of them in, in ICS that are all for different groups of people, and that's great. Um, and then we've been striving. Um, when I became chair and then dean, I sort of, I mean, I couldn't do a lot about it when I was an assistant professor or a, a associate professor. I don't remember what I was at that time, but I couldn't really do much about it when I had those six women in my, in my um, class, except to form something outside. I didn't know what the percentages were of women overall in the program. I didn't really have access to that data the way I did when I became chair and then dean. So, you know, once I had that, um, ability to try and make some things happen, you know, we really got involved. And so one of the things, um, ICS has been one of the founding members of the National Center for Women in Information Technology, and we've done a lot of work through them. Um, we, in fact, did some of the early um, pair programming in colleges based on that and, and worked with NCWIT to develop the pair programming in a box. And that's one of the things that encourages more collaboration and more um, something that that one of the studies that we did found that although everyone appreciated pair programming, women appreciated it a little bit more. So, you know, it was one of the ways to kind of change the face of, of the classroom. So. Um, and I, th yeah. I guess I can add to that yeah. too, is that, you know, the women faculty in the, in yeah. the department and school get together periodically for dinner. And, and really, Deborah's kind of personally responsible for a lot of the people sitting around the table when we go on those dinners. I know that the number of women faculty really grew under her leadership. And that was not by accident. That was very intentional. So it was intentional, but still hiring the best people. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, so the landscape of information technology, of course, has radically changed over the last 50 years. And I imagine the way that research is conducted has also radically changed. Can you comment on what practices and ideas have been per per pervasive over the years um, and what's evolved? And maybe, Larry, I don't know, can you start off with that one? Um, 
Well, and it, part of the thing is, 50 years ago, we were dealing with plumbing. It was kind of like, can we get a computer? Can we, can we write programs? Can we get the program to do something useful? Um, there was interactive computing, but it was, and it, there was interactive computing here at the very beginning because uh, Fred had, had worked up at RAND. There was a programming system up there called JOS, which was an interactive programming system. The basic guys from Dartmouth came and saw JOS and then went back and screwed it up. Uh, <laughs> Fred, and, and I don't know who else was responsible for implementing it. it, it implemented a version of JOS here at Irvine called ISIS, I-S-I-S. Peter Keith. Peter Keith. Keith, okay. Yeah. Keith. Keith. Yeah, he was and, there. And that was, the, that was the language we used, and we had IBM Selectric uh, typewriters with paper in the roll, and it was connected <laughs> to, the, to, the, to the, quote, the mainframe, I think it was an IBM 1440. It's maybe one one-hundredth of the, the uh, the power of the thing in your, in your pocket. <laughs> uh, but we were trying to build things. We were trying to write programs to get them to do something. And um, I know in my career, uh, one of the things that I used to say all the time is demo or die. You know, if you've got an idea, build a program and prove that you can do it and make it happen. And so, um, I, I presume that's still the same model today. I've been out of it <laughs> almost 20 years, so I'm not sure what, uh, what, the, what it is today. I think the thing that, it, that attracted me, I, I got into computing through something that we don't talk about anymore called office automation. And uh, <laughs> um, I, I found that there were quite a number of people in ICS that were really interested in office automation. And that was kind of rare. Um, so for me, it was nice to find, but uh, I think that was emblematic of, well, I think our interest in bioinformatics and so forth you know, comes from that tradition. I just wanted to mention somebody who I don't think is mentioned yet, Dave Farber, one of the early faculty members who had a research project in, uh, called the Token Ring. <laughs> DCS. DCS. Right. In fact, I was talking to Marsha because I, I remember that very clearly. The, the, for, for those of you who don't remember the history, there was a pretty famous uh, event in January of, I want to say, 69. Popular Mechanics had on the cover the Altair computer. How many people, how many people remember that or know about that? <laughs> okay, the rest of you go read about it. This is, this is fun stuff. It turns out that the computer was being built by a, by a guy uh, down in, in Albuquerque, and he was going to sell them. They were kits. You could buy this computer. And the popular mechanics people found out about it and wanted to put it on their cover. Of course, the machine didn't exist and didn't work, so they put just the box <laughs> with some lights on it, and that was all that was on the cover. But eventually, they produced it. So. Uh, one day we were in, in one of the offices in the trailers and, and Dave was there and, and Marsha and a whole bunch of folks and Greg and we were, we were talking about, wow, look at this thing. This thing's really amazing and we want one. Um, but then I think it was Dave was the one that said, well, no, don't get one. Let's get 50 and put them together and try and make a computer. And that was really the, 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 uh, the start of DCS. So, okay, that was 69. I graduated in 70. Uh, I lost the draft lottery, so I went into the Army for a couple of years and came back in 72, and DCS had been funded by the NSF, and there was a whole project building hardware, the token ring uh, hardware for the network, and, and uh, trying to build a little operating system that would work across the machines. Yeah, and a, and a number of the ideas that uh, we now see and use every day actually came from people who graduated, who were supported in that program, like Paul Macapetris. Macapetris, yes, yes, uh, DNS. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Don Loomis. And Don Loomis, yeah. And Larry, actually, although he was working on a dissertation for me, was supported by Dave, with no questions asked. Uh, and I worked on that, it as well. Yeah. yeah and Marcia did, <laughs> and yeah. Marcia, because that's a kind of, I mean, that's the way things were. If we had a research project going, everybody did what they could. I'll make one other point. I mean, Dick is sitting here. I guess he's too 
uh, <laughs> honest and humble to, to, to introduce Horn, but uh, Tim and Dick and some other people th th was the focus on software. Mm -hmm. um, De mm -hmm. uh, Deborah was involved in that, and, and there, we were on to software here before a lot of other people were on to software, um, before Microsoft, for example. <laughs> um, and you know, I, I think that was yeah. a, a big part of our of our future. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't agree more. That's software. <laughs> I, if you notice when you came in, there's a rack of literature out by the table. And I just finished writing the 50, 50th sorry, uh, history of software research at UCI over the last 50 years. So if you want to know more of that story, oh. <coughs> but it's, it, it was much more interesting writing about it than I expected. There were far more contributions than I expected. It's really. Quite impressive. Yeah. Pick up a copy. So another way which I think ICS stands out is its connections to the real world. We've already touched on this a little bit, but some of the most important contributions made by ICS faculty and students over the years have really been necessitated by, with, by collaborations with industry. Um, and I want to ask you, what are some of the most impactful contributions that you remember, and how has our unique culture created an environment in which those could happen. Okay, so let me respond to that. So there's an obvious answer, which all of you, I think, could probably guess. He's sitting back up there. So the World Wide Web. So you wouldn't have HTTP 1.1, the Apache Software Foundation, the Apache Web Server, without the contributions of Roy, who I had the privilege of being his advisor for how many years, Roy? <laughs> <laughs> but I actually have a second thing beyond the web and all that stuff that I think is at least as important, but much more subtle. I think UCI is responsible for changing the view of what software development entails. The historical view is this narrow, either coming out of double E and building machines, or mathematics and proving theorems. And software development at Irvine, which became software engineering, had this notion that it's not just programming. There's a management aspect. There's a human factors aspect. Mm -hmm. There's a social aspect. There's how you deal with your customers, how you think about your customers, how you think about your people. And it's that broad, encompassing notion of what comprises software engineering that I think we contributed. I think we contributed it because we didn't have those institutional boundaries that I think hemmed in other schools. Well, I think we changed the way people think about software engineering. And I actually think that's the strongest contribution. I think we had to learn, because we came from diverse areas, other languages, the languages of other disciplines. And that helped in looking at the problems in terms of our customers, our collaborators. And it kept us from the narrow focus that shows up in engineering or, or other areas. Well, and I should say, both with regards to the web work and also view of software engineering, it's because we did deal with companies all the time. I mean, Roy went to, I don't know how many IETF meetings across the country. The Arcadia project involved many companies. It was, it was part of the, part of the error. Here. And, and government organizations as well, not just yes. yeah, commercial companies. I, I'll, just, I'll just add that um, I, was, I felt very welcome in ICS, even though most of the work I was doing was on computerization of cities. <laughs> and uh, the only people who cared about that was the Soviet KGB. Uh, they, they, they came and, and uh, stole all of our working papers and so forth because they thought that computers would save the city Soviets. And, uh, of course, they didn't. But, um, I thought they funded your research. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't fund our research. They stole our research. But, um, but I think it's, 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 it's an example of looking past the short order the long-term 
effective things that was, was really important about ICS mm -hmm. and uh, has remained really important about the place, in my view. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So, okay, now we're the old farts up here talking about 50 years ago, who cares? Um, that's not the experience of today. The question I would ask my fellow panelists is, okay, the hot topics these days are machine learning, uh, data science, whatever, and just as the hot topics in the 60s and 70s are long since gone, what's gonna come, you know, what's over the horizon that we're, we're not seeing yet because we're paying too much attention to, to AI and data science? I think the once and future of the once and future king of computer science will always be design. Because whether you're working in machine learning algorithms or software development or any other of the subdisciplines, you're always thinking about how do I come up with that next thing? How do I figure out how to solve this problem? And at root, that's a design question. And I would add to that one other thing, uh, which is sort of what to include in the design considerations. And I, I think if you, I think one of the problem with design thinking as a concept is, is that it's often too narrowly constructed. Um, it's, 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 it's too much what you can do on pencil and paper. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that's really the issue with most of it. Most of it has to do with how's it gonna affect people's lives down the road. That's, that's much harder. And actually, I think design is the core question in many disciplines outside of computer science oh, yeah. as well. And I think there's actually a discipline of design, which is that broad thing. But that's another topic. I would go one, one step back and really figure out what problem you're trying to solve. I, I just, over the years, have seen a lot of work, it's good work, but it's not addressing the core problem. There's some things you can do and do them well, but at the end of the day, what do you do with it? Uh, start with some problem that you're trying to solve. There are many different ways to design it, and design is, is critical, but focus on what it is you're trying to, to solve. So I would respond, I think design is important, but to me, the problem we've, we're going to face, and we are facing, and it's, it's going to have to be addressed at some point, is complexity. How in the world do we keep these systems working in a way that you can trust what they're doing is going to be doing the right thing, or that you, you depend on being, being working correctly, um, and then suddenly they break, and now how do you figure out what's wrong with them? Because most of the systems are very brittle. You know, one change, and they just kind of fall apart. Yeah, yeah, the, to take that maybe from a different approach, it seems like we're continuing in, all, in what we're doing to follow the reductionist path, to go down to what can we do it you know, in this little bit, put those things together. Um, having some kind of an overall from the top down view, which is, it's very hard to build a, put a bunch of pieces together because uh, context hasn't been really considered mm -hmm. in each of the pieces and now the context is there. So, uh, as you're putting them together. And, and it seems to me that that kind of a view, I'm not sure what that translates to in, into actual research, so I was taken with, uh, with Mimi Ito's uh, mm -hmm. remarks about, I don't even remember the, the word she used, but does that mean we're done? No. no. <laughs> Somebody out there. Yeah. 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 Uh, the notion of the, the way in which you look at the interactions between connections. building the connections and the support and the... Uh, Seems to me that's that's a major thing that we have to be able to, to deal with. How do we deal? How do we look at the systems in terms of what the various connections are, so that when something does fail, as you say, they're very brittle. 
Yeah. One thing, how do we isolate it? We had a, a project that ran when I was there, Paul Barron and, uh, and uh, the hot potato algorithm and, and all of that, where he's really, how do we put together a network that's going to survive? Right. Well, and the ARPANET principle was uh, route around trouble. Yeah. You know, the concept that there were no spurs in the network. Well, when the, when the, when the public network got shifted to the private network, all of a sudden, somebody paying attention to the design of the whole system, they lost sight of that. And, and so there are, there are gateways, I'm sure, out there that are leading to problems because that gateway goes down and the systems don't know how to, how to, to yes. deal with it. And by the way, this goes beyond computing. Um, let me go back to, uh, to my, my wine experience. <laughs> last year, last year, there were horrible fires up in Northern California and Napa and Sonoma. Horrible fires. Every one of those fires, there were like, I think, five separate fires. Every one of them was started by an electrical line that came down in, in almost all cases, I think all but one, it came down due to wind. And you had live wires with electricity and they just lit fires. And the, the hot wind just did whatever. So why is it our electrical system is so fragile that a wire breaks at, that it doesn't have enough control to be able to say, don't send power through this line because there's nothing there. Just, so the, instead their solution is to shut down Shut the power off. Right. Well, they're shutting they, yeah. now. They're shutting down shutting all the off. power in the entire place. Know it. <laughs> and, and, oh, by the way, yeah. let me tell you about the the two the, the three tons of grapes that we picked a couple of days ago, and you bring it into the into the the uh, winery, and you can't crush it because there's no power to run the damn equipment. All right, so I'm gonna finish up. <laughs> 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 Yes. <laughs> I have one final question for our panelists, um, and it's for all of you. Um, I'd name the most significant way in which your ICS experience has shaped you personally or professionally. I'll, uh, okay, we don't have to go in sequence. We yeah. can go out of sequence. But there's more than one, but that's okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's hard to pick one. <laughs> yeah, one is... Uh, it reinforced the realization that luck, how important luck is, how important it is to happen to be in the right place at the right time. You have to be prepared to use it, but it, luck is really important. Uh, the second thing was, I got a degree in industrial administration, and I knew all, a lot of that theory and so forth, but I'd always been a worker bee. Uh, I, I learned that... Uh, at UCI, running the computer facility, and then being department chairman and so forth, a lot about what really was valuable out of all that theory and what just was stupid. <laughs> uh, and the third thing I have to mention with, with Larry here and Dick Burton in the audience is uh, joy of sailing. <laughs> I don't know, he stopped me off saying. Um, so I think two things that really influenced me. One is um, Dick mentioned Arcadia, but just very briefly, I had the reason I ended up at Irvine was because I was on the Arcadia project at UMass Amherst, and I probably wouldn't wouldn't have even applied at UC Irvine if it weren't for that, because I'm from Orange County and I had sworn I was never going back to Orange County. <laughs> <laughs> but here I am. am uh, however many, 30, 30 plus years later. Um, and then actually, uh, um, Lilliman, who was the, the EVC at the time, called me into his office one day and said, um, I'd like to appoint you the next chair of ICS. And it just came, I mean, I was shocked in some respects. <laughs> um, and I just, it came out of the blue and I didn't really know I had that in me, but then to go, from being chair to deciding that I really wanted this to be a school, not me personally, everyone wanted it to be a school, um, and then becoming dean, that, that really shaped me professionally as well. I'd like to pitch in on Arcadia too, because I, I wrote about that in the history. This was a amorphous 
consortium of universities and companies. And the thing that I think was key to its and government yes, agencies. Government, that's right. Was we would have quarterly research <laughs> meetings. We got into terrible fights. I mean, they were brutal technical reviews. But the only reason people came back the next day is that night we always went out for dinner yeah. and drank good wine. <laughs> good. Was, and paid for the students to come with us. Yes, we did. After we had brutally massacred them when they gave their presentations. That's right. <laughs> it, was the, it was that. At the, at the bottom, it comes down to a people question. You invested mm -hmm. in the people, and because you trusted the people and treated them with respect, you could also tell them that's the stupid idea. idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Marsha. <laughs> I think probably communication is what came uh, out of the experience for me. Being able to um, understand other people's terminology and being able to communicate back to them in, in things that made sense. One of the things I, still I see with, with technology is there's just so many people who just totally shut down because they have no clue as to what all these strange terms mean. They just don't want to have anything to do with any of the newer developments. And I, I think that's, that's what I got, got out of this, uh, out of Irvine, working with people, uh, getting away from my disciplines. cross disciplines, but really with people who didn't have any interest in the computer aspects, mm -hmm. but translating what we could do into terms that make sense to them. And, one of the outcomes is I learned enough medicine to be dangerous. <laughs> um, so the, Rud Rudyard Kipling and, and Ricky Tiki Tavi had this interesting line. <laughs> the entire mongoose family is eaten up from nose to tail with curiosity. And one of the things that I really got a lot more from ICS than from the management school, which I came from, was that the entire place was eaten up from nose to tail with curiosity. Uh, everybody was pursuing this stuff. It was, they found it interesting, and that was kind of contagious. Um, and I, I think that's mm -hmm. stuck with me more than anything else, is that, that curiosity, that drive. So I, I having been an undergraduate, this, this place formed me in rather dramatic ways. And then when I come back and do graduate school a couple of years later, it also it was pretty formative. I think Fred's right. I think it's, you got to be lucky. And I was lucky enough to be here at a time with a great set of people. And they have meant the world to me. And in a sense, it was the camaraderie and working together and working on an interesting problem where the goal was to solve the problem. It wasn't to somehow, I'm going to be the dominant person who wins the Nobel Prize. It was irrelevant. And that element served my entire career as one probably of the most important things. And so the example of what we saw or what I saw here in those days was just huge, just huge. Well, I want to thank our panel not just for being here today, but certainly for that, but also for making ICS what it is today and your many contributions. So thank you so much for everything.